Fate 5 of 2017. This is not going to go the way you think. Mark, we talked about this. As always, this list represents nothing beyond my whims of what I enjoyed the most in 2017. I'm sorry if you disagree. Here we go. <laughs> Hit me with that Whitney. Okay, let's rip this band-aid off. This isn't on the actual fave list because in a lot of ways I'm still digesting it. I mean, I loved it, full stop, but I'm leaving it on the honorable mentions for a second because I don't want to rush anything and it certainly doesn't need me to try to add anything to the conversation because there's kind of a lot of conversation going on despite a lot of you wanting me to do just that, but I still needed a minute or two with this one. Definitely still digesting all of the things that happened here. I can without hesitation say that my favorite Yoda scene in all of Star Wars is from this movie stunning. It's not very easy on this one was on the list, then it wasn't, then it was. Honestly, I kept moving things around, but ultimately I think Dunkirk is a movie I will revisit least simply because of the subject matter it offers. It is a brilliant film, just not one I want to rewatch a lot in comparison to the other stuff on the list. Sorry Tofno, I love you. Though structurally this is a victory lap on a taco starship because of its avant-garde tap dancing on the very idea of linear time's grave, some storylines last days, some last a few hours, one lasts like two hours, but everything is edited together as if the stories were happening concurrently. Dunkirk's a trip. It's huge, it's loud, it's brash, it features a pretty damn good performance from my boy Harry Styles. It's a stunning use of practical filmmaking giving you real in-camera scale without resorting to a bunch of cheap CGI trickery. It's great and the standout here is the structure because editing three storylines together that take place at three different timescales is kind of an amazing magic trick, which I'll admit he flirted with on Interstellar, but here he's saying something strange about war on a purely thematic level in war time is a flexible concept. Christopher Nolan has a wild control over how this film is constructed. It's wild, I can't think of another word to describe it. Yes, Blade Runner 2049 also didn't make my fave list, and like the previous two movies, that's more of a measure of liking some other films more. It's not really a big deal because I just allowed myself to say more things about the honorable mention, so really I'm giving you a fave 8, but that screws up my branding. Blade Runner 2049 is a brilliantly structured mind pulverization that will leave you pondering the very nature of existence and what it means to be alive. I have some wild theories about this movie and leave it to the master Denis Villeneuve to construct a world that so readily allows them. Ryan Gosling is a level of measured powder keg that he hasn't really been given the chance to play before. No, not even in Drive, not like this. He's teetering on the brink of existential meltdown for the entire film, which means that his acting needs to be a touch unpredictable to sell us on that. And he does. It delivers. It also happens to feature some of the best miniature work in a mainstream film since the first one. On to the main list. Get Out to my personal experience feels to be the one thing that everyone universally liked this year and I mean that specifically within cinema circles because I don't think the bad people like this one very much. Oh sit down, it's 2018, you can't not address the fact that not only was Get Out a shocking brilliant horror film down to its very marrow, it's a film that has a lot to say about what it feels like to be a black person in America since like forever. Our current state of affairs is built into every facet of this film. The microaggressions, the super chill belittlement, the loss of agency, all illustrated by a single change in perspective without doing anything but illustrating our actual current reality. Get Out is an important horror film, a phrase that I'm having trouble replicating a second example for. Cause like brilliant films have been horror movies, but stuff like The Exorcist really just taught us not to get possessed by demons, which feels like a pretty useful life skill to have without the help of a cinematic aid. Don't eat a demon. I started this section in an effort to jump Get Out right to the front of the class, but now I'm lackadaisically wondering if Get Out was the first horror movie to clock a perfect 180 on the LSAT and people didn't really notice. It's a law joke. There's, see, there's, there's layers. 
Most horror movies use often cheap horror shorthand to exemplify why a certain small town or a certain creepy murder hill folk are often disgusting and not at all together a human feeling. Get Out uses what appear to be normal everyday people to show us a terrifying world to find yourself caught in. Ours. We are in the sunken place. I still haven't thought of another horror movie that has so much value as a resource for finding and pinpointing ways to help everyone understand a minority perspective while being this damn entertaining and clever. I think Get Out might be the first horror masterpiece. The Shining doesn't have the same kind of moral compass. I was not a better person after watching it. Don't attack your family with an axe after being possessed by a hotel. Good tip. Got it. Thumbs up. Psycho, Let the Right One In, Rosemary's Baby, Cabin in the Woods, The Thing, they're all about something that they don't appear to be on the surface. They're all megaton successes on the theatrical stage as well as artistic achievements, but mean something. I'm not sure. I'm not really sure they do. And if you type room 237 in the comments, so help me Voltron. Here's some food for thought. Artistic symbolism is only as meaningful as an audience is able to understand it on their own. If no one gets your art, it's probably not as brilliant as you think it is, as your art cannot function if a requirement of it is you're standing next to it and explaining it to everyone all the time. Huh, I think my point is to get out one horror. I made a comment back with Cabin in the Woods akin to how do you make a horror movie after this? And Jordan Peele answered my question and punched my face out of my face! First time writer, director, genius, and apparently curve buster, Peel knocked this one out of the stadium and into the blimpy parking lot next door. More like get in here and watch this awesome movie. We need to take another take on that. That was terrible. Hey, speaking of geniuses, Greta Gerwig wrote and directed an instant teenage comedy classic with the purest heart of an aged silver sporting a healthy patina. A period piece taking place entirely in the somehow arty nostalgic time period known as 2003. The year we went to war with Iraq, Homeland Security came into existence, and Americans shoddily renamed French fries to Freedom Fries because we are the most insecure nation on earth. Some movies are too clever. This movie is a problem child in a nutshell. It's clever enough to get itself in trouble. This film and its characters are way, 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 17 minutes later. Way, 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 way clever. I sort of want to invent a special award for Sorcy Ronan and Laurie Metcalf who are both worlds better than I thought they were. And bear in mind, I thought they were already both fantastic. Also bearing in mind that I love Scream 2, but my goodness, this is an acting clinic. Can be scary and warm. And the writing gives them a gigantic area to create in. The characters in this movie are shockingly imperfect, often carrying their flaws around like a science fair project. It could be hard to find your place in the world. This is sort of a movie about me in a weird way. I too was struggling to find my place in the universe around this specific 2003 time period and close to Lady Bird aka Christine. What is an identity? We're all trying to figure that out. Class of 2000 represent- oh god. This film is currently sitting at a perfectly imperfect 99% on Rotten Tomatoes, and that fits. Lady Bird fits into the space of perfectly imperfect. It's about that time period where we're still inventing who we are and what we're supposed to be. A time of upheaval within ourselves. That's a tough moment to capture with any real authenticity, but Greta captures it pretty effortlessly. The grandiose confidence we have on the cusp of college age thinking we're ready to flip the world on its head and the slowly cracking fragility that comes with that. Scene 1 feels as fresh as scene 70. This story isn't about just the beginning and the end because the middle is straight up knuckled pancake. Yeah, I brought that one back. Give it a go if you haven't because... Damn. Hey, this is going to be difficult to talk about and I'm going to walk on excessively delicate eggshells here because there is some serious anger following this movie around and I totally understand what it is you're saying about undeserved redemption. However, I think this movie is a great deal more subtle than the outrage surrounding it really allows, specifically because of one reason. No one is redeemed in this film. We meet the characters, not a spoiler, in what feels like the last stage of their life, in that you can sort of tell they're done evolving. They've all turned into terrible people that are beyond saving. With the protagonist, we are given a reason for that. With everyone else, we're not. 
We know that tragedy has hollowed the soul from at least one person, and it isn't the most egregious stretch to believe that it hollowed other people out in increasingly disturbing and off-putting ways. It isn't a nice movie by any stretch of the imagination. Trigger warning, everything. Easy things to get out of the way. The performances across the board are career-defining work from a cast whose careers have multiple standouts, standouts where they're the rosy-cheeked, gentle souls who must overcome impossible odds. And these are their hollowed remains. To me, it's an important piece of art, but I fully understand if you don't want a film to cross every line in the rule book. I can't even say I enjoyed watching it, but it does have something to say about revenge stories aka the cheapest stories in film. Yeah, I said it. Revenge is cheap and it is a shortcut around character development. To wit, this is the only time a revenge story ever made sense to me. I watched Francis McDermott do a host of heinous, deplorable things and every step of the damn way I was right there with her, understanding each decision while staring in horror at them. If you love it, I support you. If you don't love it, I support you. Okay, on to another movie on my list with a disclaimer. Cause that's my favorite thing. So Baby Driver has seen it. Whoa, is that how we're handling it? Cat Huh, okay. Fair deal. I'm not sure there's gonna be a whole hell of a lot of surprise about an Edgar Wright movie being on Movies with Mikey, but I still feel like there is an ocean of depth in front of us. The music layers into the scene, the visuals layer on top of the music, the sound effects then layer back on the music, and all somehow edited by an angel with manic pixie dreamboat fingers. The script is incredibly thin on characterizations for our two budding lovebirds, because I think it's really both of them and not just Deborah. Baby's dialogue is almost, if not entirely recycled from things other people say. That's some Oscar shit right there. He is a dude constantly remixing his own life in much the same way that the film is portraying it. It's not reality, it's enhanced movie reality. Their romance is communicated almost entirely visually, never really verbally, just sort of referred to here and there. For lack of a better way to say this, we're supposed to feel their love through the music because that is the medium they are communicating in from moment one. Deborah is literally singing a song when she walks in. And I think that's important because this is a 1960s saccharine movie musical pastiche where true love can exist at first sight, remixed with a 70s car chase movie through the lens of a modern action film. Okay, that's a tall order. And the rest of it is everything I've ever wanted to love in this world, including the way sappy simple romance, because it doesn't end simple. Because at some point, real reality will enter your constructed reality. It's why Baby Shirt is darkening over the course of the film. Ergo, so does his fairy tale life and romance outside of the crime stuff. He's practically Fred Astaire at the beginning, and by the end of it, he's Snake Goddamn Pliskin. Like, I think Edgar did a phenomenal job. Kamel Nanjiani and Emily Gordon wrote a fantastic semi-autobiographical piece on the nature of surprise debilitating illnesses and the creative process. You know, my brand. The Big Sick is, is perfect, nah, that, that doesn't seem big enough. The Big Sick is baby buck choice. It's all at once a beautiful love story written by two people who lived that particular love story and all the tribulations that came with it. The most emotionally satisfying movie of the year, endlessly clever, and dare I say it, emotionally satisfying in ways that romantic comedies just generally aren't. It's more emotionally honest than most films. Here's a fun way to illustrate this. Ray Romano delivers a performance that stands up to his partner in fake movie matrimony, Holly Hunter. I'm not trying to belittle Ray Romano or anything. He's great, but she's Holly Hunter, who has been nominated for an Oscar four times, something Emily and Kumail can now also say as they were nominated for Best Original Screenplay for this. For good reason. It's brilliant. The cast is perfection. Oh, and before I get too sappy because I related to this movie on another plane of existence, it's also funny as hell. Like, movies don't come around this often where the jokes just work this good. In a movie that's sort of about comedy, but more the life of a person who does comedy, you, you feel it. 
which might be why this movie is so disarming. You come to laugh, but you just aren't expecting a movie to get so much about extended hospital stays so unrelentingly honest and correct. I mean, they lived this, so it makes perfect sense, but it's worth pointing out there is a lot to learn from this movie. People aren't at their best when a loved one is in the hospital. For fear of someone else, people are often short with each other and blow things wildly out of proportion. Small drama can quickly become big drama. It's perfect. I love it. Make this your next rainy day blankets and tacos movie. You will be glad you did. Hey everybody, it's 2018. I'm back. I took a little break to sort of recharge my batteries and write a bunch of stuff. Uh, so there's there's some changes. Hey, Trey Bichard, Sam Bacon, Iris Fox, lots of new names, Ryan Schaefer, uh, I'm trying to, Sandy Lester, okay, I'll, I'll stop. Kipsitril, that's a fun one. Uh, so the show is going to evolve a bit. Uh, over the coming year, I'm still going to do individual movie episodes, just less of them and less often, uh, more often. Hey, Ben Patton, friend. Uh, also, watch the Antiquing Hour with me and Ben Patton. It's pretty good. It's on this channel. Um, anyway, the the changes to the show, I'm going to do a bit more freeform episodes, a lot more talking about film theories. Um like actual film theory, not like, welcome to film theory. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I just, it's uh, it's, its own thing. I'm digging my own hole. Just like Ethereal Blah and Brent Medling and Caitlin Vidal and all these beautiful, wonderful people that support my Patreon. You guys are the best. Um, so in addition to, to some of those changes, uh, I'm super excited about all the stuff we're working on. And we are working on uh, quite a few things. Um, a lot of what we're doing, uh, the first half of January was just planning, planning a lot of things. There's going to be a few episodes about Star Wars stuff, including literally, I'm um, burping. I'm um, burping. I, there's nothing off brand about me burping now that I realize it. Uh, <laughs> this is a total train wreck. Um, uh, the next episode is actually going to be about Star Wars. Um, and then from there, it's a, it's a curriculum through the year that I've been designing and I'm still designing um, with, with uh, individual movies sprinkled in. You don't have to send me a, a tweet every five seconds. I am definitely doing a Star Wars The Last Jedi episode. Just, just give me another minute because there's like, it's a lot. All hell Holdo though. She's my fave. Uh, just like Kelly Nor Na 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 Naylor, I can talk. Richard Scott, Adam Thomas, Trey Warren, Ray Johnson, Patrick Mahoney, you guys are all all, all so great. Um, follow me on Twitter, uh, at MikeyFace, that would make me very happy. Subscribe to this channel, please God, I've been trying to get 100,000 subs to get the damn silver play button for all time. Uh, crank that bell, crush it. Hit it so hard it's dented and unusable, like F that bill in the A. I took that metaphor too far, I'm sorry. Live show went great. Uh, I will see you all next episode. Bye bye.